right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Douglas Kruger, who is in lovely Johannesburg, South Africa. How are you doing, Douglas? Pleasure to be with you, John. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, late evening your time, I presume. Indeed, it's very late evening. My uh, wife and I managed to watch a movie. She's gone off to bed and I'm still enduring. So <laughs> glad to be <laughs> well, with you. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, okay, well, uh, Douglas, just let me introduce you. He is an author of six business books, including the highly acclaimed Own Your Own Industry, How to Position Yourself as an Expert. And that's where we're going to focus in today. Uh, he's worked with multiple large clients, household names like BMW. But tell me, Douglas, okay, own your, own your industry, how to position yourself as an expert. Um, why is that uh, relevant to everybody as opposed to just a small number of people? Well, absolutely. The The starting point in positioning yourself as an, as an expert is that it is a choice people will make. And in fact, not a, a, a great many people vie for that premium level of competition. And for that reason, although we're what I'm encouraging is that you aim higher, there's certainly less noise at the top of the market. So that's one of the, uh, the advantages to it. Um, it also helps us to hit a much more visceral note in terms of our marketing. Rather than sounding like a low-level salesperson, we actually speak at a different level. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a level at which we start creating tribes of followers and actually, in a sense, uh, depicting a type of lifestyle, a type of persona, and a way of being. Um, and done at its highest level, it actually helps people to, to actualize themselves and to, to realize who they want to so become. So how would you advise somebody? So if I'm a salesperson, right, and yeah, I've been doing okay, I've been, you know, I've been bumping along here, but I feel like I really want to go for it. I want to, I want to uh, be more successful and excel. What are for some of the first steps I can take towards, as you say, actualizing that? Well, one of the things that I think is a little counterintuitive that most people don't do is to give away your best ideas for free. When we look at it from a sales perspective, we often we have a sense of being guarded or being a little reserved about how much information we actually want to give away. There's always that nagging doubt in the back of our minds that if we give too much, uh, we've essentially furnished the solution for free. Mm -hmm. I believe that the exact opposite is the case. I believe that when we're very generous with what we know, um, rather than just selling to people, we're sharing ways forward. And I find that what tends to happen is that people come to us for the implementation. And I've seen this, I've been very blessed to see this in my own career and in that of other speakers, experts, coaches, people involved in the world of sales. The more they're giving and the more they're helping people to become what they want to become, the more clients come to them for the, uh, the implementation of that ideal. And in a best case scenario, we want to be hearing that phrase, someone told me you're the person to talk to about. Now, what I try and focus on is how do you become synonymous with an idea? Uh, so I go a little bit beyond the idea of simply being, say, a topic matter expert or mm -hmm. being a um, being technically good at what you do. And I start asking questions like, how do how do you become so synonymous with an industry that it's almost impossible to talk about it without referencing you? And the top names that spring to mind over time. I mean, you you can't speak about, say, bodybuilding without speaking of Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> um, and you can't say daytime TV talk shows without referencing Oprah and so on and so forth. Um, and Schwarzenegger is an interesting one. And it, it plays into what we're discussing here because he is not technically the most highly accomplished bodybuilder of all time. He's right. won Mr. Olympia seven times. There are two gentlemen who have won it eight separate times. Mm -hmm. um, and yet whenever I, I speak for audiences, I, I, I put up the phrase bodybuilding on a screen. I say, quick, what's the first name that springs to mind? <laughs> it's, it's always It's always Arnold, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So there, there's a lot that we can learn from that. And obviously his television appearances and so forth play into it. But that's part of what we're talking about when we say expert positioning. It's this combination of teaching, leading, being a personality, and very much of being in the public eye. So so how would you, uh, um, and, and, and I agree with everything you said there, but so from, from a lot of salespeople, they, while they're great um, if you put them in a room one-on-one -on -one with a customer, or you put them on the mm. phone, or you even put them on with the buying committee you know they're great in those situations but if you say to them now you're going to really expose yourself to a much broader audience maybe one that they don't even see a lot of them get kind of uncomfortable in that arena 
Absolutely. And I mean, you know, the, the old joke that does the round about the, the fear of public speaking being greater than the fear of death. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion we can draw from that is that at your average funeral, most people would rather be the guy in the box <laughs> than the one <laughs> delivering the eulogy. Yeah. Um, but there's immense power in that. And in fact, of course, it's a very human fear. It's not the fear of speaking itself. It's the fear of being judged. Mm -hmm. And I think one one constructive way around that is for us to realize that we're not actually there to be judged. We're there to give value to a group of people who don't know as much as we do. If you have something that teaches a group, helps a group of people, shows a way forward, it's not self-serving to stand up in front of a group and do it. You're actually giving something that is very valuable to people. And of course, you can do it on different gradients. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to throw yourself into the deep end and stand up in an auditorium, an atrium, and speak mm -hmm. for 10,000 people on your first try. You could, for example, craft a small YouTube video that gives 10 tips to or three ways to mm -hmm. and gives genuine value for free. And once again, I return to that idea of saying, give away your best ideas for free. Let them come to you for the implementation. Don't hold anything back. Yeah. And so that then obviously will build a level of trust, right? Because I mean, if you're giving out information, you're helping somebody, then they'll uh, tend to trust you more. And they'll, if you like, they'll get past the idea of this confrontational salesperson buyer relationship. And I think, I think that's one of the key, the, the key elements there. And uh, but tell me also again, from again, from a, from a, a salesperson point of view, I mean, you know, becoming the expert, expert, you know, owning an industry, really becoming the mm. expert. Again, you know, a lot of people would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. I mean, I know some stuff, but uh, expert, I don't know whether I'm, I, I don't know whether I'm comfortable putting myself forward as an yes. expert. Okay, this returns me to to what I believe is at the the heart and soul of of genuinely becoming a recognized icon in your industry, where I, I believe it's a three part equation, and I think most people tend to to get the one idea and miss the other two, mm -hmm. and I believe that experts exist at the intersection of three different qualities, and if you don't have all three working together simultaneously, you can actually disqualify yourself as an expert. Now, the first one is the one we tend to think of intuitively when we hear that phrase, and that's that's not. Knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and knowledge is a, as a broad catch-all term. When we say knowledge, we mean uh, technical ability, capacity. You know your stuff. It's the ability to do the thing that you mm -hmm. do. But now what's interesting is when you start to study the really top names in every industry, they are not necessarily the most technically qualified people. Mm -hmm. There's something else going on there. They, they know their stuff backwards and forwards. Make no mistake about that. But there are often people who are more technically qualified than them, yet less well known. And often these are people who are not remunerated on the same scale. And that's fascinating to us. So the other two elements, in addition to knowledge, are personality and publicity. Mm. And in any industry that I've, I've studied, looking at this idea of, of experts and icons, I always find that that one comes to the fore. And of course, it's, it's again, it gets a fear reaction from us. Because if we're not very loud, verbose, over-the-top, charismatic personalities, we tend to think, well, that disqualifies me. Mm -hmm. And I genuinely believe that that's not the case at all. If you look at, let's take a world like, uh, say, the world of professional chefs, uh, Jay Amy Oliver from the United Kingdom has become a, a global phenomenon. Right. One of his books uh, launched a while ago. In fact, the, the first book called The Naked Chef. Uh, you know, millions of them sold mm. worldwide. People bought them, flipped them open, found it was nothing but recipes. They were sorely disappointed. <laughs> but what's interesting about that is that Jamie Oliver is a fairly quiet, down-to-earth, bloke-next-door kind of character. Mm -hmm. And he's not a loud, over-the-top person like, say, a, a Jeremy Clarkson in the world of cars or, or any other big personality we, we care to think of. But here's the key. We know Jamie Oliver. We recognize his face. We know his voice. And we are familiar with his personality. So that's as a result of the third thing, which is publicity. Mm -hmm. Knowledge, personality, publicity. Put those three together together. And you have the core makings of an industry expert. Take one out of the equation and you actually disqualify yourself from the potential of being a recognized icon. And the way I always like to phrase it with my audiences is I say, if you have all the knowledge, but no personality, mm -hmm. 
you are a specialist. Yes. If you have all personality but no knowledge, you are a Kardashian. <laughs> Boom. Very good. I like it. Um, so, that's, so that's interesting. And as you said, I mean, the personality piece, because that's been misused over mm. the years where people say there are personality types, but um, you can, um, you know, a good personality is a very subjective thing anyway, right? Um, so it doesn't have to be one type or the other. And then the publicity. I mean, I guess that's the piece nowadays where there's no real mm. excuse, is it? Because you have all the tools I mean, us as individuals now have tools that we could only have dreamed of um, years ago. This might come surprising to anybody who's under the age of 30, but all of these wonderful tools didn't exist. Um, Absolutely. So really leverage. So really leveraging those tools for the publicity piece is key, right? Yes. And also, you know, while you mentioned the, the, the newness of the tools, I'd like to throw in a, 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 a seemingly contradictory idea, mm -hmm. which is that the classic skills still win out. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when you study someone like, say, Jeremy Clarkson, uh, who was famously fired from Top Gear after sure. a uh, altercation with his producer, um, he speaks about how the new Top Gear is struggling. And he did it with uncharacteristic restraint. But he pointed out something that I found fascinating. He said, when you look at the credits, there is no written by, and it used to be written by Jeremy Clarkson. Mm -hmm. Now, Clarkson, for all his sort of buffoonery, is an incredibly strong writer. And he says, you know, people uh, would apply, uh, young men, young ladies would apply to the Top Gear show, and they would talk about their love of cars. And he would say, well, yeah, that's all very well, but can you write well? That's the heart and soul of it. And I think those Old classic skills can really set you apart in a world that's perhaps not using them as much as it should. And another example that springs to my mind is uh, from uh, from the United States is Mike Rowe, the um, globally famous host of Dirty Jobs on oh, the right, Discovery yeah. Channel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Now, as a, as a sort of a, a suit wearing person who mm -hmm. spends most of his life in conferences and drinking coffee, I am the world's most unlikely candidate to follow Mike Rowe. I have zero interest in dirty jobs. Mm -hmm. However, the man's skill with words, he, the beauty of his writing, his wit, his humor uh, and his intellect ensure that I am one of his greatest fans. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something quite profound about that. You know, when we when we step aside from the sort of the, the, the classical sales role and we admit to ourselves that we're talking to human beings, intelligent human beings who respect good writing, good humor, good personality, there is a great deal of value to be mined in those areas. Yeah, I have to say, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it's um, it's one of the it's one of my uh, little soapboxes as well, because I do believe that. Um, it, it's a terrible thing, but today you as a salesperson or, or as anybody, a professional, you can differentiate yourself by being polite, mm -hmm. by not, yeah. not being over familiar with people before you know them. And as you say, by writing well and actually paying attention to what you're writing, I really think yeah. that can differentiate you. Because I think people, there's, it's become so casual that it's, it's just become lazy and kind of um, almost, you know, insulting, right? So I think the human mind sits up and pays attention when it perceives something of a, a, a little bit of quality. Uh, and there's a fabulous book by Steven Pinker, and the, the title eludes me now. I think it's called The Sense of Style. And it's a book about writing in general. Yeah. But he uses a fabulous phrase, and he comes at it from a sort of a neuropsychology point of view. And he says, style earns trust. Mm -hmm. He goes into a lot of the science behind it, but the very simple version is when people see that we pay attention to small details, whether it's in writing, whether it's in how we go about uh, treating others, whatever the case might be, that small sense of style convinces people that there is a greater intellect behind it and that here is a person who can be trusted, can be taken seriously. You almost earn merit points beyond what you're actually due by simple shows of, of care for small things. So I think I think that phrase is really profound, that style earns trust. Yeah, I'm 100% I'm, I'm believer in that. I also believe that uh, uh, you, can, you, can never be, you can never be too polite. Right. You can certainly be the opposite, but I don't think you can be too polite. <laughs> yes. And yeah. and it's better to start off being formal as opposed to start off being familiar without earning that right. Mm -hmm. And and my my other one is I always believe you will never get you will never get docked points for being overdressed. 
right? Yes. <laughs> because I'll tell you one thing, yeah. I've done it myself in the past. Like I've shown up in a suit and tie for a meeting with people and they've all been in T-shirts and shorts. But hey, <laughs> nobody's going to say, well, look at him. They're going to say, eh, you know, you're, they're still going to grudgingly respect you. But if I turned yeah. up to a, a room of people who were in shirts and ties and I was in T-shirt and shorts, I'm going to have the same reaction, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. I can think of only one example that contradicts that, but it's such a bizarre one. I, I thought I'd just share it with you. Yeah, go for um, it. Yeah, we have a speaker from Johannesburg, and he's he's globally famous by the name of Clem Sunter. Um, he's a futurist and scenario planner who was the ex-chairperson of Anglo-American corporations, a very high level. And he's a, he's a very intelligent, very charming man. But because of this very high level of success, the dynamic reverses for him. He stands on a stage sure. in a very baggy jersey, hands in pocket, laughs at his own jokes, um, and he comes across as an absent-minded professor type and it's it's very charming mm -hmm. but absolutely i agree with your point if i had to do it it would just simply look disrespectful yeah i mean exactly yeah. i mean we see the steve jobs i mean when you get to that stage you can basically yes. name your own uniform right yes um, and there the dynamic reverses because it looks charming to be human exactly exactly it's, yeah. it's perfect so tell me um in the last few minutes we have here you know tell me another couple of aspects about how you advise people other than you know reading your book but what are another couple of ways people could start to elevate the idea of themselves of an expert or even get their head around even attempting to do that? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think um, one of the mistakes people tend to make early on is they find it difficult to calibrate what level of expert they are. Mm -hmm. um, and because we all have some degree of humility, hopefully, built into the psyche, <laughs> we find it hard to say, I am an expert. And in fact, you shouldn't. An expert is something that someone else calls you right. eventually. Mm -hmm. And what what we want to do is start off with a certain level of humility that says, I know this much and that's what I can teach. And as your knowledge grows, you can teach a broader and broader base and you can share with more and more people on, say, an increasingly global level. And that that simple little equation, I find, helps people to let go of a great deal of the fear and insecurity around the idea of being an expert. If you do not have the, uh, the insight into physics of someone who's been around studying it for decades, well, teach at the level of say a primary school teacher nice. and and you are an expert to a group of people who know less than you and there's something noble and something beautiful about that and that's fine and as you grow more your your influence expands so don't out claim what you actually know <laughs> and that you know that that way you never get caught out um, and in fact one of the things that i like to challenge people when whenever we speak about this topic is i say the first time you speak as a recognized expert in a public forum in the q a session at least once you should say to someone I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. And there's oh. nothing wrong with that. And I think it's a very healthy thing to do. Not only does it actually build credibility with the audience, but it keeps you at a certain level that says it's okay not to know more than I do. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great tip, actually. I, I, I love that one. That's a great takeaway for people out there is to be able to confidently say, I I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, if we've seen too many people in the past where, you know, you stand there and you think, oh, I just got asked a question I don't know. So now my brain yeah. is going to go into overdrive coming out with some nonsense to try. Yes. To try and, yeah. To try and that and actually compensate. disqualifies us as, as experts. There's no upside to it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Douglas, this has been a great uh, a great conversation. I know we could uh, talk a lot more, and hopefully we will. Hopefully you'll come back and talk again soon. Uh, but before we go, I'd like you to tell the audience a little bit more about yourself, how they can find out more about you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, most of what I do is the uh, the writing. I write books that are entrepreneurial in nature, and I speak on the same topics. Um, my um, videos and articles are all available on my website, which is douglaskruger.co, and I'm going to say .za. In South Africa, we would say <laughs> ZA. Yeah. Um, and I've got a little weekly um, motivational newsletter called From Amateur to Expert. And the idea behind that is every week I send out one free tip that says, here's the way amateurs would do it, here's the way experts would do it, let's Fantastic. raise the standards. Well, listen, Douglas, uh, Kruger in South Africa in Johannesburg. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.